Good afternoon, and welcome to session seven of the fourth annual Ant Humanities Podcast Symposium, Best Practices for Building a Podcasting Network Within Your University. My name is Scott French, and I direct the public history program at the University of Central Florida. Our panel this afternoon consists of four outstanding UCF public history MA degree candidates and also podcast producers who will discuss their respective roles in the creation of an in-house history department podcasting network. Each producer will present their podcast thesis, methodology, and contribution to the network while sharing their overall experience working within an, an integrated system. Uh, each speaker has been allotted up to 15 minutes with the final 15 minutes of the session reserved for questions from the audience. And please feel free to put your questions in the chat as we go. Our first speaker today is Sebastian Garcia. Um, Sebastian is a history MA degree candidate at UCF whose research interests include 20th century American history, particularly, particularly the cultural history of media and technology. Sebastian is the UCF History Department's podcast producer, which includes series such as Knight's History Cast, the Florida Historical Quarterly Podcast, and the UCF Veterans Legacy Program Podcast, all podcasts that Sebastian has directed, produced, researched, written, hosted, edited, and published. He conceptualized and is currently developing the expansion of the UCF HD podcasting apparatus into a networked system. And his presentation titled the UCF History Department Podcast Network Progress and Potential offers insight regarding practices for materializing a podcast network within a university context based on current developments at UCF. Sebastian. Can you all uh, see my PowerPoint? Yes, looks good. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you, Dr. French, for that introduction. My name is Sebastian Garcia, and today I will discuss the practices we have conceptualized, refined, and followed in developing a podcast network for our history department uh, here at UCF. My presentation highlights the broader progressions that we've made and the practices that have undergird such developments. Then my colleagues will sharpen the focus by illustrating their podcasts and how a network has influenced their specific approach. Oh, and what, let me see. Can you guys still see my slides or? Yes, they're not full screen, but we can see them. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't even see my, my, uh, my mouse. Let me stop the share and reshare. Um, ap apologies for that. No problem. Sounds good. Okay. Let me read. All right. There you go. Uh, four major sections define my presentation today. I'll start with a brief context, uh, illuminating how expanding into a network remains necessary and appropriate for the department, its faculty, and its students. Then I'll discuss how I approached proposing the networks to our department chair as our robust history with podcasting at the UCF History Department informed how I structured my proposal and which pre-existing pre practices I emphasized. Following the proposal, I will share the progress we've made. The post-proposal uh, negotiations have provided a space to refine our best practices to ultimately materialize a podcasting network within a university. Finally, I'll close with the potential a podcast network offers in our specific case, but also for any university more broadly. Our podcasting history at the UCF History Department can be categorized into four distinct eras beginning with the experimental era from 2009 to 2015. In 2009, the department began podcasting with Dr. Connie Lester, an associate professor of history here at UCF, launching the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast. Dr. Lester serves as the editor of the Florida Historical Quarterly Journal and created the podcast as a digital extension of the flagship academic journal of Florida history. Dr. Robert Casanello, another associate professor of history here at UCF, served as its first producer. But in 2012, he sought to depart from interview-based productions 
as he argued that podcasting could generate original knowledge and not solely synthesize or engage with knowledge like interview style shows. Uh, thus, he experimented with that idea by conceptualizing a history of Central Florida podcasts in a graduate history course titled Public History and New Media. In doing so, Dr. Castanello established a scholarly and pedagogical model that provided a foundation for subsequent student podcasters like me and the team and faculty to build upon. From 2013 to 2015, Dr. Castanello executive produced a history of Central Florida with the assistance of nine graduate students from the 2012 course. Collectively, they examined Central Florida's history through material culture, arguing that such evidence reflects a broader human history even beyond Central Florida. A Florida Humanities grant funded the production beyond the initial coursework, demonstrating a path for academics to produce scholarship through podcasting. The creation of Knight's History Cast in 2017 ushered in the departmental era. Dr. Castanello co-created the series as a complementary extension to the department's regularly scheduled events slash programming, which of course explains the UCF branding. Um, thus, the podcast primarily documented and disseminated the department's institutional history to a broader public audience. More importantly, however, Dr. Castanello negotiated with Dr. Peter Larson, our department chair at that time, to establish the department's official podcast producer titled through a graduate research assistantship. In other words, Dr. Castanello created a legitimate aid position reserved for students within the history department to produce the series and learn how to podcast as he declined to do it himself. This decision, informed by his collaborative A History of Central Florida podcast production, solidified the UCF History Department podcasting apparatus as a student-driven, faculty-supportive initiative. Yet, starting in 2020, the department's podcasting operations went dormant for the next two and a half years for several reasons, including COVID and Holly Baker, the department's first podcast producer, graduating. Aside from establishing a podcast producer title, the departmental era moniker also encapsulates how insular our podcasting operations remained as UCF stars, our internal university archive database, was the only place to discover and listen to Knight's History Cast, the Florida Historical Quarterly Podcast, and even a History of Central Florida podcast once production ended in 2015. Thus, despite devoting significant time, energy, and resources to our podcasting apparatus, we limited our potential by not publishing these series where people actually listen to podcasts. So once the department hired me in October of 2022 as the new podcast producer, uh, pictured on the right is the previous producer, Holly Baker. I prioritize rectifying this glaring limitation by not only reactivating our podcast, but also relaunching the entire apparatus into the major podcast directories. That required a one-page proposal to our department chair, arguing why relaunching into the major directories proves essential to the department and how, and how Podbean, as the hosting server, uh, facilitates that process. Once our chair approved, I spent the next six months producing new episodes for Knight's History Cast and the Florida Historical Quarterly Podcast while preparing to relaunch the entire catalog of episodes into Podbean and by extension, the major podcast directories. In April of 2023, the relaunch commenced as Knight's History Cast became available wherever you get your podcast. As seen in the picture above, the relaunch also consisted of a comprehensive marketing campaign to promote awareness that our podcasting apparatus essentially turned public for the first time. It is important to note that the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast remains located exclusively on UCF Stars, as Podbean charges excessively for including multiple podcasts. This shortcoming further incentivized me to look toward a network from a content perspective as the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast warranted a space in the major podcast directories alongside Knight's History Cast, as both series remained entirely different. Nevertheless, in the summer of 2023, ideas about a network became legitimated by producing two specialized miniseries within Knight's History Cast, a four episode run about Operation Peter Pan and a 10 episode miniseries with, about veterans history and education. The former examined Operation Peter Pan or Operacion Pedro Pan through all histories 
from survivors and interviews with academic scholars who study the historical event and the latter explored the UCF Veterans Legacy Program and its mission to honor and memorialize veterans buried in Florida's national cemeteries. From the surface, however, one cannot understand that Night's History Cast is a podcast about Cuba's child exodus in the 20th century or about veterans who served in World War II. And that proved problematic for the discovery and reach of these specialized series. The 2023 UCF VLP Institute podcast series also marked a return to Dr. Castanello's grant-driven executive producer uh, production model, which will make more sense in the practices since the proposal slides coming up. Six months later, in December of 2023, at the end of my first semester in graduate school, two other MA students, Sarah and Ross, approached me with ideas about readapting or incorporating their research into academic podcasts for the UCF History Department. The following semester, John and I conceptualized the Memory of Negro Fort podcast in a colloquium in American slavery course, which required students to create a public history project about slavery in Florida for the final assignment. We decided to produce three episode scripts, as you can see uh, next to John's picture, uh, for an academically grounded, public-facing narrative podcast about Negro Fort. Sarah, John, and Ross will discuss their respective productions more specifically. For the purposes of my presentation, however, these developments, including another edition of the UCF VOP podcast, propelled me to legitimately pursue a network as such a system can aggregate this increasingly diverse ecosystem of podcasts all being produced by UCF history graduate students and reflect the department's outstanding commitment to public history and student success. Production began throughout the summer of 2024 for Sarah's Beneath the City Beautiful and Ross's The History on Film podcast. Such collaborative spaces, particularly with Sarah and later with John, enabled me to refine skills and procedures regarding podcasting at the UCF History Department, given that they needed to learn such practices uh, to produce their podcasts effectively. In mid-August, right before the semester started, Sarah and I met with Jim Ambuski from R2 Studios uh, at George Mason University. This meeting proved critical for our prospect to expand into a network as Jim generously offered invaluable insight regarding practices they have established and followed in building and maintaining a podcasting network within a university, such as funding, hosting servers that support a network, pitching such an idea to college and university administrators, leveraging university resources, et cetera. Jim continues to guide us in our pursuit of a network. So this meeting uh, really proved uh, critical. And if he's in the audience, a uh, special shout out to Jim. Uh, during, this, during the fall semester, uh, John and I produced proof of concept of the Memory of Negro Fort podcast for an annual Florida Historical Society Symposium, which Dr. Barbara Gannon, who instructed that colloquium course, encouraged us to do. During this time, I also prepared a formal proposal presentation for our new department chair, who got hired over the summer, uh, to expand our podcasting apparatus into a network, which we collectively presented on October 22nd, 2024. So what practices did I implement and follow when constructing a, uh, the network proposal? First, I incorporated insights Jim shared during our meeting in August, particularly the language to use when making the case that a network proves necessary and beneficial for a, a university department. Additionally, I synthesized our, the institutional history that I just presented right now as context to demonstrate that expanding into a podcast network remains a logical next step. This proved critical because my primary audience was a new external departmental chair. I also researched hosting servers that enabled network expansion and incorporated such information into the proposal. Moreover, I outlined a plan. Uh, I introduced a preservation plan to highlight how we remain proactive rather than reactive about sustaining the network beyond this initial team, as that remains a unique challenge in our student-driven faculty-supported podcasting apparatus and within a university context more broadly. Lastly, I presented rather than sent a written proposal via email, given the audiovisual dynamics we want, we wish to employ, the team dynamics we aim to demonstrate, and most importantly, to establish a familiarity with our new chair, not only about our podcasting history, 
but with the people who have played a role within that history. Transitioning into the progress we have made and the practices we have reconsidered since the proposal, uh, which really can be categorized into three broad sequences, starting with further inspection. So immediately after the proposal presentation, our department chair requested that I sent him the PowerPoint for further review. Upon further review, our chair raised several questions and concerns about the network that prevented him from approving by our initial deadline. Yet our chair's concerns reflect essential issues that any university must consider when building a podcast network. As a result, his questions provided a space for us to refine our practices regarding how to materialize a podcast network within the UCF history department. So let's talk more specifically about these concerns. Our chair expressed six significant concerns regarding our proposal, starting with cost, distribution, archival control, switching host, copyright, and faculty vetting. I will focus on faculty vetting as it proves the most important in our specific case, but also remains the most unique in the context of podcasting, right? You know, in general, podcasters engage with issues like pricing plans, the ability to switch hosting servers, archival control, et cetera. However, the idea of faculty supervision and support only really emerges within a university context. So we can understand more concretely the concerns of faculty vetting. Our chair asked the following question. Why are there no faculty executive producers on some of the new podcasts that you, that you want to launch? Who is vetting the content? Drawing from the podcasts we have produced, there are three types of productions each requiring various forms of faculty supervision or faculty vetting. Interview-based productions, scholarship-driven student productions, and grant-driven executive producer productions. Our two longest active podcasts, Knight's History Cast and the Florida Historical Quarterly Podcast, are interview-based productions that remain inherently vetted. The former complements the department's regularly scheduled events slash programming, and the latter exclusively features scholars who have already experienced vetting through publishing with an academic journal. As I mentioned earlier, we remain cognizant of how to maintain a student-led faculty-supported network beyond our time. Thus, faculty can supervise the content of future interview-based productions by requiring students to answer the following questions before scheduling a guest, such as who is the person you intend to interview, what are their credentials, why do you wish to interview this person, and so on. Ultimately, interview-based productions require minimal faculty vetting. The second type of production, scholarship-driven student production, requires more faculty vetting as students claim expertise about a historical subject rather than conversing with the experts. Uh, Beneath the City Beautiful and the Memory of Negro Four podcasts provide practical examples in this regard. The former remains vetted as Sarah drew material for the podcast from entries she created for a digital walking tour of the cemetery that three UCF academic consultants, such as Dr. French, had to authorize. Dr. Barbara Gannon, pictured on the bottom uh, on the right, vetted the content of the Memory of Negro Fort podcast by grading the three episode scripts that John and I submitted for the final assignment. Her support for continuing the research in conferences uh, and beyond further emphasizes how the Memory of Negro Fort podcast will remain faculty vetted or supported. The maintenance plan we suggest encourages students to identify and work closely with faculty members who will vet the content at various degrees depending on any pre-existing collaborations. Thus, student uh, scholarship-driven student productions require minimal to moderate faculty vetting. The third type of production, grant-driven executive producer production, differs from the previous two in that faculty members seek student podcasters for pedagogical and grant purposes, whereas with the other two, students initiate the production. As I mentioned in the context slides, the VLP podcast series marked a return to this model introduced here at the UCF History Department by Dr. Castanello, as Dr. Amelia Lyons, the principal investigator for VLP, viewed a podcast series about the program she led as an effective method to satisfy scholarly and publicity standards required by her grantor, the National Cemetery Administration. As the department's podcast producer, she offered me a position within her grant team to produce the podcast she envisioned. Similarly, Dr. Castanello, through his pedagogical vision and later grant for a History of Central Florida podcast, 
created a space for the series where he extensively vetted the student productions. Our maintenance plan focuses on drawing attention to faculty members that an option to enrich candidacy for grant funding exists through this specific type of podcast production, as Dr. Castanello and Dr. Lyons' success indicates. Ultimately, grant-driven executive producer productions predetermine a particular vetting mechanism contingent on the faculty's discretion, purposes, or goals. And as a result, these podcasts necessitate moderate to extensive faculty vetting. As demonstrated during the context, our podcasting operations here at the UCF History Department remain largely a student-led faculty supportive initiative. Given this, we must always remain mindful of the system's sustainability, especially considering the transiency of students. Mitigating such rapid turnover proves unique within the university context, and our chair confirms this emphasis on maintenance as I met with him for the first time since the proposal yesterday, and this idea of maintenance continues to dominate our conversations. Three significant mechanisms currently inform our approach in developing a sustained podcast network, starting with faculty vetting. A network in which faculty must offer supervision ensures longevity for the standards established during this developmental phase, mainly because faculty, especially tenured faculty, do not experience rapid turnover as a student body. Second, we have conceptualized an application system that enables current and future productions beyond this initial team uh, while ensuring that the standards and expectations of the UCF History Department podcast network remain intact through the inquiry of the application. So asking questions like podcast title, thesis and arc, production type, most importantly, faculty members willing to supervise contributions to the network and so on. Lastly, we aim to sustain the network through internal development where UCF History Department students can learn history podcast methods through courses, internships, and assistantships in which they acquire specialized and general skills central to their professional development. In other words, courses, internships, and assistantships can function as generators or incubators of future UCF History Department student podcasters, which can sustain the apparatus long-term. Based on my conversation with our chair yesterday, I'm now considering creating a survey that gauges interest uh, with current undergrads and grad students about podcasting to demonstrate that implementing this internal development approach proves, proves viable. Allow me to close my presentation by underlining the potential a podcasting network offers for the UCF History Department specifically and colleges slash universities more broadly. A network highlights the intellectual vibrancy of the department by showcasing faculty and student research, which can attract future faculty and students to our program. A network raises awareness of our strength as a department for students, faculty, community members, and university administrators. A network provides an explicit space for community engagement for our faculty and professional development for our students. A network bolsters the department's commitment to student success by illuminating how such an organization cultivates student-driven public-facing projects. And lastly, a network elevates the department and university status as a public-facing institution by demonstrating how such an organization enables projects that engage with the broader public and intellectual communities. And if we look at our university's ultimate mission, which states, quote, UCF is a public research university invested in unleashing the potential within every individual, enriching the human experience through inclusion, discovery, and innovation, and propelling broad-based prosperity for the many communities we serve. And our History Department Podcast Network certainly facilitates and even enhances such a mission. Thank you for your time and presence. I greatly appreciate it. And I'll hand it over to my amazing team members. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, our next speaker is Sarah Boy. Sarah is a public history master's student at the University of Central Florida. She holds a bachelor's degree in history and a certificate in genealogy from the National Genealogical Society. Her research focuses on local history and Civil War memory in the 20th century. For the past several years, she has worked with Greenwood Cemetery as a historical researcher where she's recently developed a digital walking tour of the cemetery in partnership between the city of Orlando and UCF, funded by a Florida Division of Historical Resources grant. 
She also serves as the Cemetery Committee Chair for the Central Florida Genealogical Society. Her upcoming podcast, Beneath the City Beautiful, is her first foray into podcasting. Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. French. Uh, I am, I'm really excited to present my upcoming podcast, Beneath the City Beautiful, uncovering the hidden stories of Orlando buried in Greenwood Cemetery as part of the UCF History Department's forthcoming podcast network. So for the past several years, as Dr. French said, I've been working with Greenwood Cemetery, as well as UCF faculty, Dr. French included, uh, to create our recently launched official digital walking tour of the cemetery for the city of Orlando, which was funded by that Florida Division of Historical Resources grant. And my resource, my research for that tour was just so in-depth that it revealed so many interesting stories. Um, there are so many things that I discovered I was unaware of having grown up in Orlando. And so many stories that the public has no idea about. And one in particular was just begging to be created into a podcast. I, I pulled Sebastian aside after class one day and was like, we, we need to do this. This is, this is too amazing. Like the story has just so many twists and turns. You can't make it up. It's just so crazy. So I'll get into that in a moment. But today I'm going to share some insights into the podcast, um, our production process, and the valuable experience and best practices that I've gained from working within this academic network as it's being developed from the ground up. So Beneath the City Beautiful aims to explore the complex history of Orlando through the lens of Greenwood Cemetery, which was established in the 1880s and remains the only cemetery within the Orlando city limits. And Greenwood is not just the final resting place of over 90,000 Orlandoans, it's also a rich repository of local history. Our goal is to uncover the fascinating stories of individuals and families buried there to provide a medium through which we can discuss larger contextual topics. One of the standout features of Greenwood is the Wilmot Mausoleum, which is pictured here. And it's a hauntingly beautiful monument dedicated to lost love. People love this. It, it, you, if you search Greenwood Cemetery Orlando, you're going to see a picture of this on the internet. Everyone is fascinated with it. And this mausoleum serves as a focal point for the podcast narratives, which include tales of tragedy, heartbreak, scandal, and even cryptids, illustrating how personal stories are intertwined with Orlando's broader history and the broader story of Orlando in general. In our first episode, titled Genesis, we delve into Orlando at the turn of the 20th century. Our aim is to highlight complex themes of class, gender, and race through the story of the Wilmot family, who were also the builders of the Tremont Hotel in downtown Orlando. The Wilmots are the perfect example of English migration and early tourism in Orlando's Gilded Age, and through them, we can explore a wide range of topics, including racial and class divisions, gender, mental health, social norms, the early legal system, in addition to many different topics that are relevant to local history. So now I'm going to play a trailer for you. And if someone could give me a thumbs up to make sure that the sound is working once it goes, let me know. Fixed upon one of the highest points in all of Orlando sits the Wilmot Mausoleum. And within this beautiful monument dedicated to a lost love lie tales of tragedy, heartbreak, murder, scandal, and even monsters. This podcast series examines the history of Orlando, Florida through the people and stories buried in Greenwood Cemetery. Today, we invite you to come along as we explore the mysteries entombed in one of Greenwood's most distinctive features. In this episode, we begin by explaining the larger historical context of Orlando at the turn of the 20th century to explore Central Florida's Gilded Age. We will consider gender, class, and race as we examine themes of social mobility and the upper middle class Southern experience in the post-reconstruction period, the genesis of tourism in Orlando, and the quintessential Floridian transplant experience. Within this context, the central figures of this history emerge, the Wilmots and the Kavanaugh's. From the UCF History Department Podcast Network, I'm Sarah Boy, and this is Beneath the City Beautiful, uncovering the hidden stories of Orlando buried in Greenwood Cemetery. Episode 1, Genesis. I hope you all enjoyed that clip. Uh, I want to share a little bit more about the process and the best practices that we followed in creating Beneath the City Beautiful, including our research, storytelling, and production. 
So in addition to the months and months and months and months and months of thorough research that I spent uh, looking into this particular story, um, which involved archival research and connecting with descendants of the families featured in the story, we've also worked to diligently translate the academic findings into a format that's accessible to the public. Uh, we've also had to take into account the sensitive nature of some of the more complex topics in the story. And that's one of the reasons we're collaborating with a committee of three faculty advisors, um, the same ones that I worked with on the digital walking tour to vet my content and navigate any potentially controversial subjects. Um, also to deepen the exploration of local history, we're bringing in historians for interviews each episode, which has largely been possible thanks to our ability to leverage UCF's re uh, reputation as an academic institution and the network's connections. So for instance, in our first episode, we feature UCF's own Dr. Jim Clark, one of Florida's leading historians, sharing insights that will enrich our narratives. And we're also very excited to welcome renowned historian, Dr. Ricky Solinger, a leading expert on reproductive rights as a special guest in a later episode. Her insights offer invaluable context, shedding light on the intersection of personal stories and broader societal movements. As we delve into the often contentious history of reproductive health, even in the 20th century, Dr. Salinger's contributions will help deepen our understanding of how these issues shaped both individual lives and social change. Another exciting aspect of our podcast is our immersive narrative style. We strive to create a captivating listening experience by blending the talents of voice actors with rich narration. This approach not only brings history to life, but also presents these stories in a dynamic and engaging way. By intertwining multiple voices and perspectives, we aim to foster a, an emotional connection with our listeners, making history feel both personal and relevant. Additionally, we enhance our, the experience with evocative soundscapes and original cinematic scoring, deepening the overall immersive nature of the podcast. Now, although we haven't launched yet, we have focused on establishing strong production practices. Collaboration has been key, uh, as we're learning from both successful academic podcasts and popular non-academic shows. Our goal is to create content that's not only engaging and accessible, but also historically accurate. And we're putting a particular emphasis on narrative structure, sound quality, and audience engagement strategies to ensure that our episodes really resonate with our listeners. What we're hoping to achieve with this podcast is empowered engagement taking academic history and transforming it into a tool to enable the public to become active participants with the history of Orlando. A critical aspect to do this is our commitment to experiential community engagement. We aim to encourage listeners to get out there and do history themselves. Each episode, we connect our narratives to local cultural heritage sites in partnership with the Orange County Public Library's Local Wanderer Program. This amazing program creates opportunities for library card holders to visit cultural heritage sites for free, enabling us to make our local connections truly accessible. For example, in our first episode, we spotlight the Central Florida Railroad Museum to highlight the crucial role that railroads played in Orlando's early development. And by promoting local sites, we're not only supporting our community, but we're also offering our listeners a tangible way to connect with the history we discuss. Throughout this process, we've faced challenges, obviously, I'm sure all new podcasts do, technical issues, narrative clarity, time management. However, these experiences are helping us to refine our methods and learn to adapt. For instance, we've incorporated a practice of storyboarding each episode, which allows us to visualize the flow of our narrative and identify any gaps before recording begins. Additionally, we sought mentorship uh, from experienced podcasters, as Sebastian pointed out, who have provided invaluable insights on industry best practices, helping us navigate any potential pitfalls. Podcasting has rapidly evolved into a crucial tool for academics looking to connect with broader audiences. Students and faculty in UCF's history department are embracing this medium as a way to bring historical narratives to life. And as we prepare for our pending launch, we're continuing to develop best practices and collaborative methods to enhance our storytelling capabilities through podcasts like Beneath the City Beautiful. Being a part of the network significantly enriches our project. And even though this network is still brand new and not off the ground, not fully realized yet, it's already offering a supportive environment where we can share resources and learn from each other's experiences, allowing us as students to gain valuable marketable skills and professional training. And this collaboration fosters a sense of community among the podcast producers, allowing us to discuss challenges, celebrate successes together, which is so inspiring to be part of a collective like this, to amplify our voices, especially as students in academia and in the public sphere. 
Additionally, our inclusion in the podcast network enhances the podcast's quality because of the access to resources, the reach and the overall impact it can give us. I am just so thrilled about the possibilities ahead. Following the release of this first episode, we intend to explore additional stories from Greenwood Cemetery, highlighting diverse voices and uncovering lesser known histories. We also plan to engage with our audience through social media and community events to ensure that local history remains a vibrant part of Orlando's narrative. This engagement is crucial for fostering deeper connections with our listeners and with the past. So I hope this was uh, a good presentation and gave you a little bit of an insight on what we're doing with Beneath the City Beautiful. I don't want to uh, encourage you to scan that QR code uh, if you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn or follow any of my work. Um, but thank you. I will hand it over to our next presenter. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, our next presenter is John Lancaster. John is a master's degree candidate in history at the University of Central Florida. He previously earned BAs in history and English and an MA in English also at the University of Central Florida. His MA history work employs interdisciplinary approaches to issues of memory, national identity, and ideology in 19th and 20th century European and American contexts. John's presentation, The Memory of Negro Fort, Creating an Academic Podcast Within a University Network, examines how the podcasting medium might engage with themes like historical memory and considers the processes and possibilities of constructing an academic project within a university podcast network apparatus. John. Thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. French. Um, everyone can see my screen okay? Okay. Um, a university podcast network offers several opportunities for organizing and adapting academic work for the podcast medium. While popularity in historical-centered podcasts continues to grow, university students and faculty remain invested in constructing public projects that showcase some of the best practices in higher education that higher education emphasizes when creating and exhibiting scholarly work. Determining how historians might utilize features and effects offered by the podcast medium to present academic work remains of particular interest to all those involved in podcast creation. A university network apparatus allows for opportunities like collaboration between students and faculty members, the professional vetting of work and various topics related to that work, and the ability to attract professional historians from other universities to contribute to scholarly projects. All of these opportunities afforded by the creation of a university podcast network emphasize the role scholarly collaboration plays within the world of academia. Applying these collaborative methods to podcasting opens up new ways of viewing the unique possibilities the medium has with regard to telling legitimate and engaging history. My paper today will consider how one continuing podcast project originally conceptualized in a graduate history colloquium at the University of Central Florida exemplifies these possibilities. Throughout this presentation, I will argue how and why a network influences the development of this podcast project. And I'll also play a brief uh, audio clip uh, from our work in progress to highlight how academic podcasts can materialize from university settings. During the spring 2024 semester, Sebastian, you already heard from, and I, uh, began to develop a public history project as part of Dr. Gannon, Dr. Barbara Gannon's colloquium on American slavery. This project became the Memory of Negro Fort podcast. This developing work considers how various social, cultural, and political groups throughout the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries engaged with the memory of Negro Fort and utilized these memories to navigate their own historical moments. After the War of 1812, British troops stationed in what was then Spanish Florida abandoned their defenses along the Apalachicola River, about 70 miles south of present-day Tallahassee. The fort positioned there subsequently became home to a growing population of Native Americans and escaped enslaved people from the southern United States. By the summer of 1816, the presence of this fort, and especially its over 300 occupants armed with weapons and ammunition left behind by the British, represented anxieties over the quickly expanding slavocracy that defined Southern politics, society, culture, and economics by the early 19th century. In July, 1816, the US military destroyed this fort, which politicians and commentators of the era had begun to call Negro Fort. 
The Memory of Negro Fort podcast utilizes the idea of historical memory to examine how various groups employed the memory of the fort and its destruction in the two centuries following 1816. Historians engaged with memory Historians engage with memory by analyzing how people represent and remember past events within the context of their own historical moments. Rather than remaining a product of the past, memory proves intimately tied to the present. When constructing this podcast, Sebastian and I look to important historians of memory, like the French historian Pierre Nora, to ground our work in scholarship on the topic. Building off of frameworks developed by Nora and others, our project analyzes primary source materials like nonfiction books, letters, and government documents to consider how various historical actors viewed Negro Fort through time. As my classmates and I have learned throughout our studies at UCF, these methods prove similar to how professional historians might begin a written work. Though we incorporate academic and interpretive methods that professional historians might traditionally use when writing a scholarly paper or article, the medium of podcasting allows historians to engage with memory in new and unique ways, not always possible in traditional written formats. While we began our work according to these traditional methods, the practices Sebastian and I applied to the Memory of Negro Fort podcast exemplify this. For instance, the use of music and sound effects evokes memory through their emphasis on emotion. While memory remains connected to emotion and music and sound effects prove great ways to evoke emotion, applying these podcasting features within an academic context can prove challenging. The following clip from the Memory of Negro Four podcast highlights some of the best practices we employed when analyzing the historical concept of memory. Specifically, we include sound effects relevant to the historical period, as well as effects laying over quotations from figures who recalled Negro Four memory through time to conjure the atmosphere of the past. Uh, this clip I'm about to play briefly introduces the concept of memory and showcases one example of Negro Fort remembrance from an African-American educator in the South uh, who lived during the 19th century. So hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Can everyone hear that okay? Episode, we have recounted the history and narrative of Negro Fort, including its construction by the British during the War of 1812, its existence as a home for hundreds of Seminoles and formerly enslaved people following the war, and its eventual destruction by the U.S. military in the summer of 1816. But once the smoke of Negro Fort's destruction cleared, how did 19th century writers, politicians, and historians recollect the story? Did they all remember Negro Fort the same way? In this episode of the Memory of Negro Fort podcast, we use the lens of historical memory to analyze how various social, cultural, and political groups in America re-presented the story of Negro Fort through the 19th century. Different groups emphasized different aspects of the fort and its history for a number of complex reasons. But these differences highlight precisely why historians remain interested not only in the events of the past, but also in the perceived memories of those events through time. The past always beckons us, promising to help each generation make sense of their world. It is not so much Negro Fort itself, but rather the ways in which Americans remembered the history of it throughout the 19th century that proves the main focus of this episode. The memory of Negro Fort constituted an important space for disparate groups to make very different claims about the United States. For example, by the end of the 19th century, the memory of the fort, for some groups, symbolized an important space of community struggle at a time of continued Black oppression during the Jim Crow era. Some African American writers and educators, like Edward Austin Johnson, engaged with the legacy of the fort as a means of resistance to this oppression.
Beginning in the 1880s, Edward Austin Johnson, a former enslaved person, served as an educator in several segregated schools in Georgia. During this time, Johnson realized that many black children of the period, whose parents or grandparents had been enslaved, lacked information about what he described as, quote, the many brave deeds and noble characters of their own race, end quote. In an attempt to remedy this, he wrote a textbook for children aimed at highlighting black history since the 17th century. The result was the 1891 book, A School History of the Negro Race from 1619 to 1890. In it, Johnson references the Battle of Negro Fort and its aftermath as follows, quote, many were instantly killed by the falling earth and timbers. The mangled limbs of mothers and babies lay side by side. It was now dark. Fifteen persons in the fort had survived the explosion. Sixty sailors and officers responsible now entered, trampling over the wounded and dying, and took these fifteen refugees in handcuffs and ropes back to the boats. The dead, wounded, and dying were left. They remained unburied in the fort. Wounded and dying were not cared for, and all were left as fat prey for vultures to feast upon. For fifty years afterward, the bones of these brave people lay bleaching in the sun. Twenty years after the murder, a representative in Congress from one of the free states introduced a bill giving a gratuity to the perpetrators of this crime. The bill passed both houses. Notice how Johnson's recollection contained visceral details and vivid descriptions of Negro Fort's destruction. For a textbook written for children, references to mangled limbs, decaying bodies, and bones bleaching in the sun seem especially violent imagery. But we should understand these stylistic choices as reflective of the particular memory that Johnson constructs surrounding the story of Negro Fort. For Johnson and other members of the black community of the era, the violence inherent to the history of Negro Fort remained a vital characteristic of its memory. By the 1890s, this violence committed on a largely black community 80 years earlier represented a poignant and useful analogy to the similar violence committed against black bodies throughout the Jim Crow era. Johnson also utilizes the space of the fort's memory to negotiate the legitimacy of black history to constructions of U.S. national identity. Though the U.S. military eradicated Negro Fort from the bank of the Apalachicola River, Johnson, through his passionate recollection of the destruction's carnage, offers a version of the story that might have resonated with many black Americans of the time. For instance, casting the people who perished at the fort as brave in the context of this school textbook highlights his desire to resist ideologies related to black stereotypes and oppressions of the period via educational materials. Additionally, his final point that in return for the murders of nearly 300 people, the perpetrators who blew up Negro Fort received a pension serves as a scathing indictment of injustices still permitted by the U.S. government against black communities throughout the latter half of the 19th century. By using Negro Fort as a lens to examine memory, we hope to articulate how historians engage with these issues to critically analyze how groups utilize representations of the historical past to navigate their own contemporary moments. We remain cognizant of certain issues relevant to situating a project like the Memory of Negro Fort podcast within a university network. Uh, the vetting of academic work associated with the university re represents one of these continu continuing issues. The, the Memory of Negro Fort podcast began in a graduate level colloquium and has been continually supervised by faculty familiar with the historiographies, methodologies, and practices relevant to the subject matter. The UCF History Department remains committed to teaching and emphasizing public history methods in both these graduate level classes and in undergraduate courses. We view the Memory of Negro Fort podcast as a model that future, grad, gra, that future graduate and driven undergraduate students might look to in order to expand their classwork into public facing projects. As mentioned earlier, the collaborative opportunities afforded by the organization of a university podcast network allows for the development of these unique student professor relationships that extend past the limits of one semester's coursework. The University of Central Florida History Department also emphasizes professionalization this entails teaching students not only what historians do on a daily basis, but also how they might create important connections inside and outside their university. Public history projects have the potential to reach far beyond the confines of the classroom, 
even if they originate there. Podcasts produced within an organized university network have the ability to attract professional scholars from national and even international institutions to collaborate. The unique modes that podcasting operates by allows these historians from various geographic locations to connect with and record with students. A university podcasting network helps to leverage the status of the university itself to attract these additional historians who may specialize in certain topics of interest to students. This intra-university collaboration, itself a crucial aspect of academic work, serves to legitimize this work as scholarly in nature. This further collaboration remains a possibility we look forward to exploring with the Memory of Negro Four podcast. This presentation has considered the opportunities a university podcast, podcast network apparatus offers to students interested in continuing scholarly public history work outside the classroom. The Memory of Negro Ford podcast represents just one example of how academic work might translate into the podcast medium. We hope that this developing podcast serves as an example for the potential such a network can provide students interested in producing academic podcasting content. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, and last up is Ross Lennon. Ross is a public history master's degree candidate at UCF. His academic interests include the history of film and the movie industry, the Cold War, the history of technology and the internet, and American cultural, economic, and political history. Ross is also the host of History of the History on Film podcast, which looks at the intersections of history and media studies. Ross, you're up. Thank you, everyone. All right, now I've got to share my screen. There we go. Um, can everyone see that? Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Ross Lennon. Um, I am the host of the History on Film podcast. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my show, a little bit about uh, sort of the nuances of working with a network. Um, my show is live already, um, as of this week, actually. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, just navigating that within the larger network structure. Um, but let's start, start first with what my show is about. Um, so it's not another film history podcast. Um, film podcasts are very common, just like history podcasts, um, but rather we look at how we can use film and use media studies to tell popular history. Um, so one of the episodes we have now, out now, is the Billy Wilder film, One, Two, Three. Um, and so we look at that not just as, oh, here's a cool movie that was made, but what does this tell us about America's role in Europe following World War II, um, the ways in which American popular culture helped to reshape a lot of Western Europe, um, and then today, we just did an interview with uh, the MASH historian talking about the role of the TV show and movie MASH uh, in depicting the Korean War and sort of using that as a lens for the Vietnam War um, and the turbulence of the 1970s. Um, our show prioritizes public history. Um, we do a lot of interviews with academics and experts but always with the intention of creating it for the broadest possible audience. Um, we really try to take experts and present their material to the public um, because, you know, a lot of times we'll read these really excellent, you know, books and monographs and they don't get the same, you know, public recognition that they deserve. And I think people are interested in it. We just want to be a go-between uh, for that kind of material. Um, and our motto is we make the fun parts educational and the educational parts fun. Um, two episodes that we've done. Uh, the first is Mazes and Monsters, which is the 1982 Tom Hanks TV movie um, about Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and so we use that to look at sort of the satanic panic and the third Red Scare in the 1980s. Um, we take this very schlocky TV movie and we try our best uh, to make something educational out of it. And then uh, we recently did an episode on the anime Akira um, and using that as this wider lens, this lens to the ways in which America and Japan had cultural exchange 
uh, particularly through animation uh, through the 20th century. And we tell the history of anime in the West uh, through Akira, one of the most popular, uh, one of the first popular animes in the United States. Uh, so I have a trailer for you. Um, this is a teaser trailer for episode seven, The American Robot. I spoke with historian Dustin Avnet, uh, and he wrote the book about how the robot as this cultural symbol changes over the arc of American history. Um, and it's a really, it was a really fun interview. It's a really great book. And it's the kind of thing that I think a lot of people would enjoy if they knew about it. And so I see part of my job as bringing this kind of material to as many people as I can. Anyone here? No, not hearing anything just yet. Okay. Um, I don't know. Do you have the file just on your computer? Yeah. Try to play it, like, get out of the car okay. and try to play it off offline. Okay. Do I have it on my computer? Alternatively, you could stop sharing, and when you go to reshare, there's a button to click call share computer sound. Okay. Yeah, so first, yeah, stop sharing on Zoom, and then when you go to share again, Gotcha. Let's see if that okay. works. All right, let's try that again. Perfect. The History on Film podcast is a series that looks at the intersections of history, film and media studies, technology, and more. Our show is public history in action, connecting scholars with a wider audience in order to make academia more accessible. Here's a sneak peek of one of our upcoming episodes to show you what we're all about. Digging into the book itself, you write that the American robot in culture is a cipher for America's relationship to labor, and that the robot is both a humanized machine and a mechanized human. I wonder if you could talk about the distinction between those two and how the robot was both a vision for the future and also this dehumanizing concept for workers. Yes, yeah, so robots are a cipher for a lot of different things. Um, but one of the things that I do argue, and I, I am I am trained as a as a labor and cultural historian, so part of this is my own own interests here. And the the reason why I I decided to write a, a dissertation and then ultimately this book about about robots is because I noticed very very early on in my uh, PhD program when I was research researching things like automation in uh, the 1950s and 60s is that people were using the term robot and the, the character of the robot you know, right in popular culture and things like that in two very distinct ways. And when I make that distinction between humanized machine and mechanized humans, what, what I mean by that is that Americans have really used the robot idea to refer to two very related but almost inverse narratives at the heart of modern life. And, and one of them is that the humanized machine, which is how machinery seems to be acquiring more human characteristics um, and the other um, a mechanized human is like how at least some people um, seem to be coming more mechanical and so you've got the robot kind of synthesizing and combining these two very distinct narratives about our society right um, that start on the opposite side but both end up in the same place, right? A world where there is no differences between human beings and machines, right? A world where everything is some sort of mixture of, the, of both of them. The History on Film podcast, available now on Apple Podcasts and Spotify with new episodes every Monday morning. The History on Film podcast, We'll see you at the movies, but, you know, on your phone.
so now I'll talk about the advantages of being involved with a network. Um, the university association really helps open a lot of doors. Um, as I was getting started developing the show, uh, having that .edu email address really helps you uh, get to talk to a lot of people who may not talk to you otherwise. Um, and so in addition to in, uh, interviewing several people who worked at the university, I was also able to speak to a lot of other people who, you know, for better or worse, may not have given me as much credence um, if I didn't have, you know, the the backing the backing of a prestigious university. Um, it does give you access to resources and guidance you wouldn't have otherwise. UCF has two really great. Uh, we have a brand new recording facility called the Hitmaker Studio, um, and then we have UCF is a incredible technology school. So we do have other recording spaces on campus. Um, so just learning the ropes, I was able to learn it on a much more sophisticated system uh, than I end up using now. Uh, but I was really able to get the ball rolling that way. Um, the opportunity to help others, Sebastian has been very excellent in helping get the ball rolling for me and everyone else here. Um, and then the existing promotional infrastructure being able to have the university network uh, to help put things out into the public is a lot better than just trying to really produce something on your own and then throw it into the ether. Um, the challenges of network involvement. It is not at your pace. It is at the network's pace, um, which means that you are at the whims of the slowest option possible sometimes. Um, but that's really just, I mean, that's one of the trade-offs of working with any kind of a group. Um, you do have content considerations. Um, it's not what you feel comfortable putting out. It's what, uh, your shareholders and stakeholders feel comfortable putting out. Um, we haven't had that kind of an issue. Um, you know, being a history network, obviously we, you know, we're adjacent to a lot of sensitive topics and themes. Um, but at the same time, a lot of the people that I interview are published. Um, and so, you know, you do have that, you know, degree of gatekeeping built into it as well. Um, but, you know, th that's always there um, because sort of the downside of doing a public history show is that you're putting it out to people who, you're putting it out to a lot of people who want to learn what you have to say, but some who may not have the necessary context and good faith to interpret what you're saying um, genuinely. Um, logistical log jams, if everybody wants to use the same space at the same time, uh, if everybody wants to release it the same day, uh, you know, you do have to, you know, you're living in a, in a bigger house, so you got other people to deal with. And then interdisciplinary difficulties. Um, you know, a lot of my, my show, we said, oh, it's going to be one way. It ended up you know, a lot of the stuff has gone a totally other way. Um, and so having to say to people, oh, this is my history podcast, but we do history of technology, but we do media studies, but we also riff on bad movies every so often. Um, you know, it does, it does force you to stretch and then uh, sort of be able to justify that to other people as well. Um, we did decide to release my show in advance of the network's release. And I think what we're going to do is bring some of the episodes over and house them within the network um, or release edited versions, uh, lightly edited versions um, of some of the episodes as well. Um, went backwards. There we go. Uh, just really briefly, because I do a lot of academic interviews, I did want to share some of my best practices uh, for academic interviews. Find an interesting book or project. Um, that's the easy part. There's a lot of incredible stuff out there. Break it down, and I say break it down first, because when I contact the author or the creator, I like to be able to show them that I've done some of the work up front. I've read the book, you know. I've I've engaged with I've I've identified the major themes of what they're doing. Um, not only because it makes the rest of the process easier, but it shows them that I'm willing to put in the work. Um, then what I do is I develop a list of qu questions with a discussion timeline. I share that with them in advance of the uh, of the interview, just to show where I see it going, 
They're welcome to give, you know, feedback and response. Uh, I want them, you know, this isn't a journalism type of interview in the sense that there's no gotchas, you know, there's no, like, we're both trying to get their material to the widest possible audience. And so we both want to make sure that the themes are getting hit and the main ideas are getting brought to the fore. Um, and then I record it and then we share the edited draft. Um, I always share it with the person I interviewed before it goes out to the public. That's just best practices, making sure that, you know, we both agree with what goes out before it goes out. Um, and then just lastly, tailoring the interview to the audience, working with a university. Uh, I'm quite a bit older than most of the people that go to the school with me. Um, so finding things that resonate with younger people, finding the hook and leading with that. Um, I assume the audience doesn't know much about the subject and my goal is to always teach them something about it so that even if they go and say i've never seen this movie i don't know what this show or topic is about that they walk away with one thing sort of leaving them engaged with the material and then easy one describe the book don't spoil it um you know you want people to go seek out um your interview project and not feel like oh i i got that so just some of my best practices um, from my work that I've done. Thank you very much. My name is Ross Lennon. The show is on Apple and Spotify. Um, and there's my email website and the show is on Instagram. Thank you, Ross. All right. We have time for a few questions. Let's see. I know there's been an active chat going on and, uh, invite anybody who was in the chat to sort of bring the question into the main forum here. I got a couple questions. Uh, John, do you have any first before I go ahead and ask a couple of mine? Are you talking to this, John? Me, John? Yeah, sorry. John Barber, no. you got any questions? Otherwise, I got like three or four, but I don't want to hog the stage here. No, that. thank you very much. I, I don't have any questions, but I would like to say uh, compliment. Uh, what an amazing series of presentations um, taken all together. It was like listening to a series of podcasts that were interconnected by a common theme. There was consistency that ran through it. And I thought your use of voices and other sound effects uh, really did add to uh, the work that you're doing. So kudos all around for a really wonderful experience on my end as a listener um, and just to end with the last point, knowing nothing about what you're talking about and having learned quite a bit in the process. Thank you. Over to you, Rebecca. That's so well said. And I agree with you that the level of preparation that each of you brought to this presentation today speaks extremely well of the, uh, the, the direction that you are taking this network. And I think you're going to have a lot of success in what you do going forward. Uh, the first one that I brought up in the chat was for mostly Sebastian, but maybe for all of you. I was curious if there's overlap in personnel between the various podcasting teams. As a network, does that mean you're sometimes sharing editors, sharing fact checkers, sharing hosts at all? Uh, yeah, the the team boundaries are very fluid, right? Um, um, in terms of the technical side, besides Ross's podcast, I... I mainly edit both Sarah's show and also John's podcast and the departmental podcast. But certainly um, once we progress further in our developments, I mean, this initial team, um, we're gonna be wearing multiple hats, especially, you know, uh, we're all, they're all getting more comfortable. They're, they're slowly getting to my level of expertise. And once that does happen, we could start sharing, um, you know, more roles and whatnot, but but yes, the, the, the boundaries are most definitely fluid. Cool. Sarah, when your trailer incorporated a bit of voice actors coming in and you discussed that's a facet of immersive storytelling of podcasting, it made me think a little bit of moments in Ken Burns documentaries when you have a voice actor reading a letter or something. Do you find that in the podcast setting, it's actually even more immersive than that? I, I don't, I think it is a little bit. I kind of took, drew inspiration from some of my favorite podcasts that do this sort of a thing and kind of combined elements from different podcasts that I just really love. Um, and so we wanted to make it 
where you're not just listening to me talk the whole time or maybe me and a guest, um, but be able to bring these in. And our resources that we had were so rich. I wanted to be able to give some of these characters, especially, you know, the, the our female heroine in the story, like she hasn't had a voice historically. So I feel really good about being able to give her a voice through the words we know that she said, um, being able to, to replicate that um, and, and bring that back felt really, really good for me. I thought it was a good blend in the clip that you played for us of seamlessness and yet shock factor at the same time. <laughs> it was, was aiming to make them want to listen. Got to keep listening. <laughs> what was that? And and you know we won't get to that part for a little while, so we got to keep listening. That's pretty cool. John Lancaster, I actually had a pretty similar question for you, which is about the addition of music and what music brings to the table for a podcast. Um, specifically, I was wondering if you see a comparison with musicals where people would say if you're going to have a theater piece which incorporates music it needs to move the plot forward and I was curious if you feel that music and history podcasts are more like simply adding color and flavor or if they are moving the plot forward or moving the narrative forward in some way yeah that's a great question um I think to some extent um music makes the listening experience more engaging and uh even a little bit more fun to listen to um if that is appropriate to say within an academic historical context but i do think considering the podcast that i presented is really engages with the idea of memory and memory is a really interesting concept because on the one hand um, historians do look to it in a very academic way and there's a lot of scholarship on how memory uh, emerges in those uh, contexts, but also memory is a very emotional and visceral experience for people even outside of, well, that's, it's just part of human nature really. And so it's a fine line sometimes between um, maybe exploiting emotion a little bit too much versus engaging with the concept of memory in a rigorously intellectual and scholastic way. And in that way, I think employing music at certain times and in certain ways can not only evoke the idea of memory, but also engage with it and get people primed to uh, access their emotions, not in only a emotional way, but also to, to understand the connection between emotion and historical scholarship. Thank you. And then my question for you, Ross, has to do with genres of podcasting. In the previous session, some of the UVA WTJU speakers were talking about the fact that in academia, you see a lot of interview style podcasts. You sometimes see narrative style podcasts. But it struck me that what you're doing with Hist on Film is a little bit like a chat style podcast. Uh, is that an identity that you would uh, say you embrace? Yeah. So I we really try to tailor it to whatever the project we're talking about is. Um, so we have a couple of different de facto formats. Uh, my host, my co-host Ryan and I, if it's a movie that we're watching together, um, it really takes on more of a, like a research paper slash, you know, riffing on a bad movie kind of feel where we'll go through a film, talk about whatever historical themes we're trying to bring to the fore. Um, and then depending on the movie itself, you know, maybe have some fun at it, its expense. Um, but then when we're talking with a scholar or someone who's in charge of like a big project, we talk to a lot of archivists, people who have these great preservations and collections. It's really just more about finding what they bring to the table and then doing whatever gets that best uh, to the fore of the discussion. Um, so the topic, the discussion we had today with the MASH scholar, uh, it was really just trying to hit on all of whatever we could to make the connection to audiences that have not seen a 50 year old TV show. Um, when it's a book, it's really just finding out what the meat of the book is about and then pulling out enough that we cover it and we'll leave people wanting more. Um, but it, it really just depends on what the, what the topic of the episode is. And then we go from there. Um, 
Thank you all so much. Um, I think this was a beautiful way, way to close out the day. Yeah, thank you, John, I agree. <laughs> and thank you all for taking the time to be with us. You're doing so many things right. And I'm really excited for this to become a model for other departments and other universities to, to use for inspiration. Thank you for having us.